Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing cellular necrosis part two. We already discussed part one in our previous video on our YouTube channel, so go check it out. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. With that being said, let's get a quick recap of cell injury and then we're going to go right back into cell necrosis and finish off this lecture series. Now, cells have the ability to adapt to certain levels of stress, but essentially when the level of stress placed upon a cell exceeds the cell's ability to adapt, you're going to have cell injury occur. There are many different ranges of cell injury. We talked about them in previous lectures, but what you need to remember is that you have two main stages, which are the reversible stage, a hallmark is cellular swelling, and then you have the irreversible stage where you're going to have membrane damage occurring in not just the cell, but also in the mitochondria and the lysosome. And the schematic you need to remember is that when you have a normal cell that gets damaged and it goes into the reversible cellular injury phase where uh, a cell can actually go back, that is what the reversible cellular injury phase essentially is, right? That's why we have this bidirectional uh, uh, arrow placed right here. It can go back to the normal cell phase. Once the stress has not gone away and it continuously is placed upon a cell and the cell progresses from reversible cellular injury to irreversible cellular injury, cell death is imminent. It is going to happen no matter what. It is guaranteed. Now, when it comes to necrosis, this is cell death happening in a large scale. Essentially, some uh, some type of stress was placed upon these cells at a large scale, and these cells were not able to adapt. They were not able to go back to the normal cell phase, and they ended up dying off on a large scale. Usually, this occurs because of some exogenous like a uh, stressor that's being put on the cell, and the cell ends up having uncontrolled cell degradation occurring again at a large scale scale. What this means is that the normal cellular enzymes that control cell death or apoptosis are inactivated. These cells are not functioning the same way. They were destroyed, they were damaged, and those normal processes are no longer in play. And this usually is due to something else that's happening. This is not intrinsic. This is not happening naturally. There's some other stressor being placed upon these cells externally that's causing this to happen. The key things you need to remember is that when this does happen, when an exogenous injury does occur upon a cell, you're going to have the release of the intracellular components, and those components are going to be pretty damaging to, this, to the neighboring areas as well. And the hallmark of necrosis is the presence of inflammation. You are going to have inflammation occurring. Very, very important. Now, there are different types of necrosis, and in our previous lecture, we discussed coagulative, liquefactive, and caseous necrosis because they kind of go hand in hand, and they're very close to one another. They have similar, uh, um, similar morphology or pathology. But today, we're going to be discussing gangrenous, fat, and fibrinoid necrosis in this lecture. So, with that being said, let's just dive right in, and let's talk about gangrenous necrosis. The hallmark of this is tissue, necrotic tissue, that usually occurs in the extremity. So, if you're talking about the extremities, or you get someone who presents with some necrosis occurring in the extremities, most likely it's going to be gangrenous, okay? Very important because we talked about coagulative necrosis occurring in heart organs or solid organs like the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys. We talked about liquefactive necrosis occurring in the softer tissues like the brain. And then uh, we talked about caseous necrosis occurring in tissues, but in caseous necrosis, you have both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis occurring at the same time. Gingerous necrosis is similar to caseous necrosis, except that it can happen in the GI tract. It can also happen in uh, uh, it can happen in the GI tract, especially after chronic ischemia. Okay, now this can be a type of coagulative or liquefactive necrosis. The reason why I was just saying that gangrenous necrosis, right? gangrenous necrosis is similar to caseous is because of the fact that both of these have components of coagulative or liquefactive necrosis. In caseous necrosis, you have usually both occurring at the same time. In gangrenous, you have one or the other. You don't have both. But essentially, coagulative and liquefactive necrosis play a big role in gangrene, in gangrenous necrosis. Usually, this is often seen in diabetics, right? Diabetics have a propensity to get uh, nep uh, nephropathy occurring. Their nerves don't function properly because of such high levels of glucose in their bloodstream. It causes nephropathy. And this type of, sorry, a neuropathy, this type of neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, ends up causing patients to not feel when they 
get hurt and then when they have a cut or bruise and they have an open wound it gets infected and essentially it ends up leading to gangrene and uh and you get gangrenous necrosis occurring there are two main types of gangrenous necrosis you should be aware of the first type is dry gangrene dry gangrene usually occurs with coagulative necrosis happening in it then you have wet gangrene. Wet gangrene is liquefactive necrosis. So what are the, going to be the hallmarks? Well, coagulative necrosis means you're going to have a hard necrotic tissue. And in liquefactive, you're going to have a softer necrotic tissue. Both of these are going to be uh, necrotic no matter what. Then when we're talking about dry gangrene, this usually occurs in ischemic or coagulative necrosis without there usually is not a bacterial infection superimposed. Usually, this is just happening by itself. When you talk about gangrene, wet gangrene, you have liquefactive necrosis that is usually superimposed by a bacterial infection. And the reason why that's important is when you look at the gross slides, let's zoom into this right here. In this gross slide, you can see that this is a very dry tissue, essentially, and it looks like it's dry because you have no liquid happening. There's not much that makes you think that this is wet gangrene, okay? Remember, this is coagulative necrosis primarily that's happening. In this slide right here, we are now dealing with wet gangrene. Okay? And as you can see, there's some pus building up right here. There's some erythema. Okay, you have some pus. And essentially, this looks more like an infection and because of that, you can see you are going to have more liquefactive, I might have spelled that wrong, liquefactive necrosis occurring here. Okay, that is very important. This is what gangrenous necrosis looks like on a uh, gross scale. Next, we're going to talk about fat necrosis. Fat necrosis is essentially a necrosis of fatty tissue, fat. And when the necrosis occurs, you are going to have a hard mass. That is very important. You're going to have a soft fatty tissue, okay, that is then going to die off and become a hard mass. Usually, this actually ends up happening because of damage to a fat cell. Often, it is exogenous damage, and this damage releases lipases, which are going to break down the fat cells, and it break, breaks down the triglycerides specifically, and this lab liberated fatty acid then binds to calcium, and this is going to cause a hard uh, morphologic appearance. So a hard morphology happens because of this spawnification, okay? The spawnification of fat and uh, occurs when the, tri the broken fatty acids from the triglycerides bind to the fat. And let's break this down. So the triglycerides are going to break down into fatty acids, and they're going to combine with calcium, and this is going to cause hard tissues to occur. Usually, this occurs in two main locations. Number one is the breast. And usually in the breast in females, this happens due to breast trauma. That breast trauma is going to cause damage to the breast cells. That's going to cause the breast cells to break open, releasing the lipases that are going to break down the triglycerides that are going to bind to the calcium that are going to end up having a hard mass occur. That is very, very uh, a common presentation you're going to see. The other condition is the pancreas. Usually in the pancreas, you're going to have fat necrosis occurring, and that type of necrosis occurs because of pancreatic enzyme destruction that's causing the, uh, the fat necrosis to occur. This is what fat necrosis looks like. As you can see, these fatty tissues are being broken down, and you have all this hard mass right here and right here that should not be here. It should look more like this. You see this fatty tissue that's filled with triglycerides and fatty acids inside the cytoplasm. It should look more like this, but instead you have this really dense material located right here, which makes you think of fat necrosis. The histologic characterizations you need to remember is the outlines of the dead fat cells located right here. And the spawnification, sorry, the outlines located right here and the spawnification of the fat that's happening right here in this large re, uh, region right here. 
Finally, we're going to talk about fibrinoid necrosis that occurs usually in blood vessel walls. That's the hallmark location. Usually, this is because of some immune reaction that's happening. It could be stuff like polyarthritis nodosa, preeclampsia, or a hypertensive emergency that's leading to high pressures in blood vessels. At the end of the day, you're going to see proteins leaking from the vessel walls, and that is the main hallmark. Now, when it comes to the mechanism, this is a type of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction where immune complexes are actually going to bind with the fibrin and cause vessel wall damage to occur. And the characterizations histologically that you're going to see are going to be thin, or sorry, thick, pink vessels, they're going to be thick because you're going to have this deposition of fibrin that's also damaging the cell walls at the same time, um, and you're also going to see proteins being released. As you can see, this is your blood vessel. These are your red blood cells. Okay, I know it's hard to see what I'm writing. So this right here are your red blood cells. And as you can see, you have this area of the red blood, the, the blood vessel that's very thick. Okay, this is a type of fibrinoid necrosis that's happening. And if you zoom in and you look at the cells, you're not gonna see any nucleuses as well, right? You're not seeing you know you're not seeing as many nucleuses, which is gonna tip you off that to the fact that some sort of necrotic uh, mechanism is happening. That is very important. So that is fibrinoid necrosis. And that wraps up our two-part lectures on necrosis, cellular necrosis. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support really means a lot. And stay tuned for more.